The 2022 NFL Draft wasn't as quarterback heavy as we thought it would be. Only one guy actually went in the first round, and nobody else even was taken until a run on QBs in the third round. The last of those three was Matt Corral. The kid from Ole Miss was supposed to go in the first round at one point, but there's a lot that you don't know about Corral that could be the make or break in his NFL career. At the 2022 NFL Draft, Matt Corral was one of 21 players invited to attend in person. He obviously felt confident enough to be there, and it just didn't work out at all. Corral had to sit there and not hear his name called, and then on day two, didn't even hear it called in the second round. It was the third round by the time the Panthers eventually took a shot at him at pick number 94. That's one hell of a slide, but why? Well, to sum it up short, off the field issues. But it's a lot more complex than that. Ian Rappaport added a little bit of context. Corral has reportedly dealt with multiple alcohol issues and has had unreliable behavior off the field. Plus, Corral has publicly admitted to battling depression, which is another thing Rappaport noted. It seems like those were just some things that teams put into consideration, and it's one of the big reasons why Corral went so late. However, that might not be the only reason. Injuries might also be another thing that scared off some teams. If you remember the Sugar Bowl, Corral actually decided to play in it, something that most high draft picks don't do in order to not get hurt and literally lose millions of dollars. Well, Corral played, and he got hurt. It looked bad at the time, but luckily it was just a high ankle sprain. That being said, he had the same injury two months before too. I mean, teams were probably already worried about Corral being a bit smaller than normal and not being too bulky at six foot one and about 210. One of the big questions that still stands is what the Panthers quarterback room and depth chart are even going to look like by the time week one comes around. Carolina went out and traded for Sam Darnold last off season, and it sounds like everything is pointing to him being the starter, at least to start the season that is. But I can't imagine Imagine that the Panthers are married to the idea of him being their guy. He's about to play on the fifth year of his deal with no contract in 2023. And let's not forget that he sucked in 2021. Nine touchdowns to 13 interceptions. Just bad. Plus, Carolina does still have PJ Walker, an XFL standout that knows head coach Matt Rule well from his time playing for him at Temple. Unfortunately for him, if Carolina wants to carry two quarterbacks, he's the odd man out and probably gets cut. Now, there's also Davis Cheek, who doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. He's an undrafted rookie and, well, he's probably Cheeks. <laughs> There's also the lingering question of whether or not Carolina would pursue another quarterback should they become available. Yes, I'm talking about Baker Mayfield. Now, there's a couple of things that could happen with him. Deshaun Watson may get suspended and the Browns get Mayfield to start, or someone like the Seahawks could snag him, but it feels like Carolina would be a great fit for him. I'd be willing to bet it's something the Panthers are monitoring right now, but after drafting Corral, it's probably not a priority for them. The Panthers could end up being a good spot for Corral. He likely needs to sit and learn as a rookie, and in Carolina, he'll have to wait his turn anyway. And when it is his turn, if it ever comes, there's already some good weapons surrounding him. Christian McCaffrey is always the main guy that comes to mind. He's an elite running back that can be a quarterback's best friend because he can run or you can stretch him outside to catch passes, and that's huge for a running back. Also, he can be a rookie's security blanket if needed. On the outside, DJ Moore is a more than capable number one wide receiver who's gone for over 1,000 yards in the last three seasons, and this offseason, he got his bag. Carolina does still have Robbie Anderson, who, let's not kid ourselves, is actually a beast and kind of a big threat. Plus, Carolina is hoping that Terrace Marshall can find his footing in 2022 after a bad rookie year. Most of the worries for Carolina come on the offensive line. To put it lightly, they really, really sucked. Carolina had one of the worst offensive lines in 2021, but you can't say they didn't try to address it in the offseason. The Panthers had the sixth pick at the draft and took E.K. Iquanu, a tackle out of NC State. Iquanu was talked about as going as high as first overall at one point, and he's one hell of a player. 
Underrated, but I actually really like Cade Mays too. The Panthers took him in the sixth round out of Tennessee, and he's a guard who I think could be a guy that starts as a rookie and just progresses well over time. Now, I'm sure you guys already know, but Corral has one of the funniest high school stories maybe ever. Corral was a California kid who originally attended Oaks Christian School, but he later transferred to Long Beach Poly. So, why did he transfer? Well, that's a, that's a story. Corral said that Oaks Christian was for rich kids that were never going to have to work a day in their lives. That's why he didn't like it there. But he ultimately transferred after getting into a fight with Wayne Gretzky's son. Yes, that Wayne Gretzky. Ultimately, it kind of helped in a way. Corral dominated at Poly and earned a four-star rating, was considered a top 100 prospect, fourth best pro-style quarterback, and top 10 player in California. When Corral got to Ole Miss, he was thrusted into the backup role behind Jordan Te'amu. If the name sounds familiar, it's because Te'amu has played in just about every spring football league you've ever heard of. Well, he played enough in 2018, which allowed Corral to redshirt. He appeared in just four games, passing for two touchdowns to an interception and rushing for two touchdowns. Corral took over the starting role the next season and he kind of sucked. The Rebels were just bad and so was Corral in his split time with John Plumley, a guy who switched to wide receiver and transferred to UCF. Corral played 10 games and only threw six touchdowns in under 1,400 yards. He didn't really have much of a role in the run game either. 2020 was a new year in Oxford, however, especially for Matt Corral. And why was that? Well, one name. Lane Kiffin. Kiffin gave Corral the full reins of the offense, and it worked. He showed flashes and passed for 3,300 yards and 29 touchdowns, but it did come with 14 interceptions. Corral started making some noise and even saw some usage in the run game with over 500 yards and four scores. But it was nothing compared to 2021 when Corral began to dominate through the air and on the ground. He was named second team all SEC, had 11 touchdowns on the ground, over 600 yards rushing, still passed for over 3,300 yards again, and had 20 touchdowns to only five interceptions. The Rebels went 10-3 and, and were ranked as high as number eight the last week of the season. Matt Corral has been one of the most polarizing prospects for the last year. But from here on out, things are only going to get clearer. The talent is there, make no mistake of that. But there are things to worry about, and that's why, at the end of the day, we're talking about a guy who was drafted in the third round, not the top 10. Now, the question is whether or not the Panthers organization is going to develop him correctly and help Corral turn into an NFL caliber passer. I do think that Matt Corral has one of the highest ceilings out of anyone taken at the draft, but he also has bust potential written all over him, more so than a guy like Malik Willis, I would say. He was so damn fun to watch at Ole Miss especially last season, and I really hope we get to watch him start on the gridiron again soon, this time in Carolina Blue. 